he announces from the very beginning of this, from the very first paragraph, that this is a piece of evocative writing, that, that this is emotionally freighted. A giant fist has punched in the upper stories of the concrete buildings and has crumpled a gasometer like a tin. Derelict machines, wires, steam piping and girders festoon the cold furnaces. The language of this broadcast reminds me of the modernist poetry that I know my father admired. What the momentary heat did to human beings near the centre of damage may be judged from a photograph on which you see a granite step roughened by the heat flash except where an unfortunate man sitting on the stone has screened it and has preserved its polish at the cost of his life. And it launched him on first his radio and then his television career. However, the emotional power that marked Bruno's 1946 broadcast soon became part of a more entertaining personality as a good-natured public intellectual. The Brains Trust was a popular show in which four highbrows sat in a studio and answered questions sent in by the audience. Uh, a very special welcome back, Dr. Jay Bronofsky. Bruno was a regular panellist. Uh, Parnell Kerr, or Carr, whichever he prefers, of Yule, Surrey, writes, Why are modern composers so afraid of a tune? We had a lot like that. <laughs> and then Mr. Roger Wood of Birmingham asks why no other composer gives him such complete enjoyment as Bach. A work of art is a living yes. thing. Mm -hmm. The man made it, but he only took it so far. Then the man who renders it, the composer, the speaker, the man who hangs the picture, adds something. But in the end, the work of art lives in you. Yes. You're the person who has to listen exactly. to it. I can only say this constantly to people who talk to me about modern art or modern music. You know, it's you who've got to create it in the end. Yes. If you yes. give it yes. its full value, you will get its full value out of it. But Bruno was emphatically not just an entertainer. He had something important to say. scientist, poet. After the war, revulsion at the inhumanity of the atomic bomb produced a public distrust of science. A large number of people tend to feel that the scientist stands, as it were, outside moral issues, feels that he's in a, in a neutral position. <laughs> you know, I think the scientist as a bogeyman is pretty dead. Yes. Don't you? Despite all he had seen and done during the war, Bruno was now on a personal crusade to explain why people ought to trust scientists. You know, we've only been living on this planet a comparatively short time. You know, how old is man? Oh. 30 million years. Uh, by this time, we're very unlikely to have many of the answers right. And what a great scientist does is to approach the world with questions. <laughs> Meanwhile, Bruno's career in applied science advanced. In the 1960s, my parents moved to Southern California as Bruno became associate director at the New Salk Institute there. Founded by Jonas Salk, the biologist who invented the polio vaccine, these laboratories were a clarion call for a scientific future. At the Salk, I listened to a radio broadcast my father made at this time. I'm distressed to see how many people today are afraid of the future and of science together. I believe that these fears are mistaken. I've come to meet a scientist colleague of my father's here at the Salk Institute. Mel Cohn too went to Japan in 1945, not as a scientist, but as a young medic in the American army. I mean, just picture yourself walking into a city that doesn't exist anymore. Footprints that are burned into the ground, the person who was standing there evaporated. It's, a, it's the kind of thing that is obviously very uh, touching and very uh, emotionally uh, affecting. After returning from Japan, Mel Cohn enjoyed a brilliant career as a biologist. He too never lost faith in science. I wonder if Mel's story can help me understand my father. I'm trying to work out how my father retrieved his optimism, his absolutely 
dogged sense that science was the key to the future. He was a rational human being. But what about you? <laughs> what about you? You have to remember that both Bruno and I are of a very special generation. The Great Depression, a war that involved the world and was probably the most destructive, far beyond any atomic bomb. And we were part of that generation. We survived it and we suffered through that so that in order to deal with the world, a certain amount of optimism was necessary. Mal Cohn has given me an arresting insight. Bruno was a survivor too. As a young man, science had helped him make sense of the world and given him confidence in his own abilities. It continued to do so even after he'd witnessed the dreadful destructive power of the atomic bomb. In 1960, Bruno wrote and presented Insight, a television series exploring in a personal way key scientific ideas. This is my earliest memory of my father on TV. We live in a time when things express their function and meaning by their shape. Here's a ship's propeller. The fact that it pushes the water aside is expressed as clearly in its shape as in any words that I can speak. When Insight was broadcast, I was a scholarship girl at Cheltenham Ladies College, which had a good reputation for science. Just like my father, I specialised in maths. Returning to my old school and watching my father here reminds me how strong his influence on me was. When people ask me what it was like to grow up, in a house, in a home, with Jacob Bronowski. I always say, and always have said, it is absolutely the same as it is for you watching him on television. So I am his little um, uh, case study of what he really wanted for the whole of the next generation. By the 60s, I had three younger sisters, Judith, Nicole and Claire. These photos give a real sense of the Bronowski household. Our father taught each of us in turn to play chess. The man behind the camera was a close family friend who was also a professional photographer, David Farrell. He and his wife Manning recall how Bruno was at home. What I'm trying to do is to have a conversation with him which is, of course, absurd because he died when I was 30. In fact, I've lived more of my life without him than I ever lived with him. Uh, and the way to have that conversation, of course, is to have it with the people who knew him and perhaps understood him. And that's really how I come to be speaking to the two of you. Well, that's right. And when I came with the camera, I always felt this, this closeness that mm. Bruno had with with his girls. This is a picture of my father with Nicole, my, Nicole, my uh, and third sister, Claire. and Claire, yeah. the, the youngest one. He loved playing games with Yeah, first he's playing Go yes. with Nicole and Claire. Well, Look yes, at Claire's face. Yes. And chess. And chess. chess. Yes. This is Go again. Yes. Let's, oh, here's the chess. Here we are. Here's now, what I think is so lovely is that he, he made you think. That was the thing. Deeply, not, nothing superficial. And, and, and that he was imparting his knowledge you know, through you, somehow, you know, that he, he wanted, he expected, and he wanted you to be well informed and successful in your life. I loved living up to my father's expectations, but it eventually caught up with me. I followed Bruno to read maths at the University of Cambridge. Halfway through my degree, I realised I just wasn't good enough to become an academic mathematician. My confidence was absolutely rocked. Coming back to Cambridge reminds me what an important moment that was. And it was a huge, huge crisis. 
for me. I feared I was disappointing my father. It was a very important moment in our life together, as it were, and I confessed to him and I said to him I couldn't go on. Bruno was totally supportive. He suggested that I quit maths and change to English literature. I did so and got a good degree. Then, like him, I stayed on at Cambridge to do a PhD. When I got my doctorate, my PhD, in 1974, my father sent me from America, where they were then living, his doctoral gown. And it came with a letter I still have saying how wonderful it was that I was following in his footsteps. Bruno died in 1974, not long afterwards. All these years later, I can see that my relationship with my father was warm, even intense, but very much on his terms. I was his dutiful daughter. Having glimpsed Bruno's personal crisis while he was in Japan in 1945, I now wonder if I had missed something in what he was saying. The obvious place to look is in The Ascent of Man, which was my father's last word on mankind and science. Here, even nuclear physics is celebrated as one of the great triumphs of the 20th century. At twilight on the sixth day of creation, so say the Hebrew commentators to the Old Testament, God made for man a number of tools that give him also the gift of creation. If the commentators were alive today, they would write, God made the neutron. Here it is, the blue glow that is the trace of neutrons, the visible finger of God touching Adam, not with breath, but with power. I replay a selection from The Ascent of Man in a viewing theatre. The title of episode 11 is Knowledge or Certainty, and it's about the limits of scientific understanding. I first saw it at the screening the BBC organised to launch the series. I was there because my father was recovering from a first heart attack and was determined this should be kept out of the public eye. It is in this programme that Bruno deals with Hiroshima and Nagasaki. In his concluding statement about the bomb, Bruno quoted a physicist who worked on it, his close friend, Leo Zillard. I had not been long back from Hiroshima when I heard someone say, in Zillard's presence, that it was the tragedy of scientists that their discoveries were used for destruction. Zillard replied, as he more than anyone else had the right to reply that it was not the tragedy of scientists, it is the tragedy of mankind. Then the film cuts immediately to Auschwitz and the machinery of mass murder. Here Bruno made a speech that seems passionately to contradict the overall thrust of the Ascent of Man series. He warns that science gives humanity awesome powers and it is essential that mankind does not misuse them. It's said that science will dehumanize people and turn them into numbers. That's false, tragically false. Look for yourself. This is the concentration camp and crematorium at Auschwitz. This is where people were turned into numbers. Into this pond were flushed the ashes of some four million people. And that was not done by gas. It was done by arrogance, it was done by dogma, it was done by ignorance. When people believe 